Welcome everybody to a look at a brand new box set from Radiance Films. Now this is the third box set they've released so far this year. There is one more that is coming later this year, which is the World Film Noir number one box set. So really looking forward to that. But this one hasn't disappointed at all either. And it is the End of Civilization, three films by Peter Shulkin. And uh, yeah, hope I'm saying his name right. I'm not particularly great at saying um, names that aren't, you know, English names, to be honest. I'll, I'll admit that right there and then um, but still it's got a really nice box artwork to it this artwork here is featured on the first film that we'll see and yeah it's a nice big hard box each film has its own case and they are the three films we will be looking at again really nice artwork down there and uh, yeah the first film is The War of the Worlds Next Century from 1981 it's a sci-fi dystopian drama uh, clocks in at 97 minutes long and it's a, a film that opens on December 18th 1999 just a few days before the dawn of the new century a local reporter Ian Edom uh, announces that the Martians have landed uh, shortly after that his program loses its independence he is given the script telling the crowds how to welcome the invaders so it's kind of a melding together of the likes of War of the Worlds and 1984 from H.G. Wells. And yeah, it's not, you know, got tripods or massive destruction scenes or anything like that. It's a lot more grounded in terms of what a Martian invasion might look like. Because, yes, you do see the Martians themselves, but they kind of look like normal people, to be honest. They're not, you know, got long tentacles or, you know massive kind of different kind of facial looks or anything like that they're basically in silver uh, they've got like silver jackets on and whatnot and yeah they are looking too different too dissimilar to humans basically but that does makes it a little bit more um you know unnerving that these creatures that look similar to us are behaving in this manner uh the uh, place that it's also set comes across as a more uh, as a totalitarian police state already it's just that these aliens have, you know, furthered that aspect on a little bit more. Because, yeah, the, the totalitarian uh, police state is just doing everything it can to please the aliens. And it doesn't care how many people, uh, you know, get hurt or get harmed in the process. And, uh, yeah, the aliens themselves um, do have the kind of aspect that's in the War of the Worlds in terms of the red weed. It's not actually a weed, but... It is in terms of uh, the fact that they are extracting blood from people and you are uh, encouraged to uh, extract, get your blood extracted uh, in hope of, uh, you know, new freedoms and not being, a, uh, you know, attacked or, you know, marginalised in that regard. So, yeah, it's really, really good at setting all of that up. So, yeah, but on the whole, I'm not going to pretend that I understand the circumstances in Poland at the time when this was made as, yeah, Poland was... In all sorts of different kind of states, uh, quite frankly, at that time. But even so, I think this melding together of the War of the Worlds and 1984 has thematic weight that not only works, but in some regards, even feels relevant to this day. Roman Wilhelmy, who plays uh, Iron Edom, is also excellent in the lead role. The supporting cast is good. The pacing is on point. It is well shot. Even though I doubt the filmmakers had a lot of money to work with, this overall has a production that certainly feels unique. The score is well done and it is engrossing throughout. Just don't go expecting, like I said, any tripods or large destruction scenes. And you should get something out of this, although it is unlikely to be any joy, as this is extremely forthright in condemning the passive nature of the majority. And that's kind of the majority that is, yeah, just enraptured by TV and believes the lies of TV. And you see all of the behind the scenes of these aspects that are going on. Like there's this court scene that is quite clearly being rehearsed and played out to make Iron Edom look like a bad guy, quite frankly. And yeah, then when it stops going from like the camera points of view and stuff like that, you see that it's just a set. It's not a real court, it's not real anything in that regard. And yeah, in that aspect, it does kind of remind me of Network from the uh, late 70s in terms of its condemnation of the way that TV is used to, um, you know, manipulate and, you know, make people think something's going on that it isn't so yeah it's really really good it's not perfect uh, as i said the political aspects or the thematic weight might not quite ring true to audiences for today so it doesn't for me you know i was born 11 years after this film came out um and i certainly wasn't uh, knowledgeable of you know 
pre 1990 Poland, for instance. So, uh, yeah, but it's still a great effort. I really like the artwork, which is kind of like an over exaggeration of what Iron Edom is being made to do. He's being made to put on a brave face, he's made to smile, he's made to make out that this Martian invasion is only ever a good thing. There's no negative sides or anything like that. And, uh, yeah. I really really do like that uh, artwork and then you've got the artwork on the back which has well basically to become a friend of the aliens you um have to basically get a, a numbered tag pierced into your ear and that is what those three are and yeah disc itself there and on the as on the disc itself we've got a 2k restoration that was supervised by the director himself before he sadly passed away i think he was he died in 2018 and yeah uh, as well as sound engineer um, both of which worked on the, the film itself for this blu-ray um for the and it's on blu-ray for the first time in the uk you've got a uh, summer summer Sayak, uh, the independent film republic a documentary on war of the world cinematography and uh, cinematographer and his work featuring interviews with Sulkin and Andre Waja, among others. Uh, that's directed by Adam Lewanski uh, from 2012, clocks in at 30 minutes long. Again, I do apologise if I'm butchering anyone's name. I It's just hard to sometimes find, you know, the right pronunciation on the internet, quite frankly. Then we've got PRL, Polish Post-Apocalyptic Fables, a video essay um, by Dobrotka Wickelentz, Wickelweeks. Uh, on how science fiction surreali surrealism and the grotesque was used to explore themes of consumerism, uh, rectification and alienation um, by the director and others during the Polish People's Republic. That's from 2023, clocking in at six minutes long. Seems quite a lot to pack into six minutes, but hopefully that works. Then we've got Labyrinth, Jan Jelenin. Len Lenica's uh, award-winning short film about a flying man who visits an Art Nouveau metropolis. That's from 1963, clocking at 15 minutes long. And then we have reversible artwork as well. So yeah, that's quite cool that they've been able to find a short film from all that time ago, which I doubt was uh, given, uh, you know, a lot of um, love and attention in terms of keeping it in a good condition. But yeah. They found something, you know, from 60 odd years ago to, well, nearly, yeah, 60 years ago to the day, actually, or to the year, uh, as a short film. So, yeah, that's really, really cool. And then the second film we have is OB Obar, The End of Civilization. This is from 1985. It's a post apocalyptic drama. So, we're after all of the, uh, after the world has gone to hell, basically. Uh, clock's in at 89 minutes long. So this takes place in a post-apocalyptic future where humans live in an isolated vault uh, which is falling apart. Their only grain of hope lies in a vessel known as the Ark, which is said to be on its way to rescue them. However, the existence of the Ark is a myth planted by the main character whose profession is to ensure that the morale is maintained. So basically the reason why they make up this myth of the ark is to get people to this vault this shelter which is basically a big dome um that's the only way they could get people to go there after the nuclear apocalypse cuz yeah they were just basically had no hope no desire to live when they thought that basically they were just going somewhere else to die whereas obviously if you have the uh, give the people the knowledge that they're not just going somewhere else to die, but they're going somewhere else to be actually rescued and get away from all of this. Then that's what, you know, forced them, um, helped to force them to go to this dome. But obviously it's not real. Uh, it's even over a tannoy where it's constantly saying to these people that are waiting for the art to set off that it's not something that exists. It's not real. You're only wasting your time, basically. Um, but yeah, they don't believe it. To be honest, because they, why would you? You have so little hope in the world. This last little sliver is ho that you're holding on to is all you've got to keep you sane, basically. So, yeah, but like with the Pride film, this isn't a film that inhabits a hopeful and positive world. While it also condemns the nonsense that is religion, as the whole idea of the Ark is seen as a religious thing. Um, as it promises everything, but delivers nothing but certain death through inaction. As, yeah, nobody's trying to do anything else other than wait for the ark basically they're not caring that the dome that they're in is crumbling around them they don't care about trying any other form of escape they're just concentrating on the ark itself so um yeah 
the setting is not only just wonderfully realized but also well used it's uh yeah really rather downbeat lots of concrete lots of low lighting and um yeah as you, as you said it's crumbling apart which is really uh well emphasized by the fact that this guy has been given this completely pointless job of covering the cracks up with these glass pieces and once the cracks move the glass pieces will fall off and he basically says i don't need to do this because i can see that the uh, cracks are getting bigger i even hear them uh, at night so uh yeah he's basically just been given this monotonous job just because they have nothing else to do basically um the pacing is also on point, the cast is great, despite the limited setting, the cinematography is so fluid it really looks boring. The plot is engrossing throughout, the score is well done, and although I feel the ending could be somewhat more satisfactory, it does ultimately fit the rest of the plot. So, yeah, another really, really good effort. Uh, what I gave War of the Worlds 4 out of 5, I give this 4 out of 5 as well, to be honest. Uh, so, yeah, even though it looks somewhat similar to that film, it's still a, uh, got its own kind of vision and its own uh, thematic weight that it's con condemning. So yeah, on the disc itself, we've got again another 2K restoration, supervised by the director, cinematographer, and sound engineer on this one. We've got audio commentary by M Michael Brook from 2023. We've got retro futurism interview with Futurette with production designer Andre Kowalski or Kowalsk, uh, as uh, cr on creating the world of OBO Bar. That is from this year, 2023, clocking in at 23 minutes long. Then we got Cages, Miroslav Kudjidok, I'm not even going to bother trying to say it, um, it which is an award-winning short film about a guard and a prisoner, freedom and captiv captivity from 1967, clocking in at eight minutes long. And then we got Reversible Sleeve Artwork again. So I've, again, they found a 1960s um, short film, which again is impressive to find such a thing like that. So there's a reversible artwork, which, to be honest, isn't any more upbeat, as quite frankly. Yeah, that's our main character in his lonely, lonely room. And finally, we have from 1986, Gagar, Glory to the Heroes. So this is a sci-fi comedy of all things, clocking in at 84 minutes long. So decidedly a different kind of genre. Um to go for obviously the previous two were dramas and they were really really downbeat and although this doesn't have a huge amount of uplifting moments it's still a little bit more light on its feet and it's set in the 21st century where prisoners aboard a penitentiary spaceships explore unknown worlds scope one of the prisoners is sent on a planet though to, thought to be lifeless until he finds humans on it now it's not explicit whether or not this is earth or not it's called i think australia 428 or something like that um so yeah whether or not it's actually earth or not is kind of irrelevant though to be fair because there are at the end of the day humans on it and uh yeah although this doesn't wholly work in the latter genre as it is and it is my least favorite of the films in this box set it is still an engrossing effort that features many of the positive traits of the two prior films in that the cinematography production cast pacing and general plot are all really good it also has some thematic weight to it and although it isn't consistently funny, there are still some laughs to be had. And uh, yeah, it has its violent moments as well, but again, nowhere near as um, downbeat as the previous film, uh, two films. Um, but you do have some aspects that do come through on this one that were in the previous two. You've got, again, a, a, what looks like a totalitarian police state. Uh, the police are manipulating people into thinking that the... Uh, this person is a villain rather than a hero, although they do call them heroes. Um, it's purely just to, um, yeah, it's a bit mixed in terms of why they call them heroes, um, I feel. Although, to be fair, the fact that the comedy doesn't quite translate into English, perhaps, is why it doesn't quite work in terms of being funny. But it also means that it might well not quite work in terms of, you know, what, why they're calling them heroes, these people that come down onto this planet and then uh, get allowed to commit crimes and then get killed for it they get impaled basically on these big spikes that are in this massive stadium um i might be misremembering though to be fair um but regardless it still works in its own right even if the plot isn't you know wholly uh you know in depth or anything like that because just the look of it the cast the general vibe that's going on and the fact that 
it rarely lets up. There's no real slow moments in this one, where even in the previous two there were uh, as areas where things just slowed down and just came to a little bit of a halt just to hopefully give you a breather. But with this one, yeah, it does not let up at all. And that's probably because it is only 84 minutes long. There's a lot to pack into this film in such a short space of time. But still, it's a really good film. I like the artwork on that as well. That's suitably weird, which is kind of what this whole box set is at the end of the day. It is quite weird. Um, don't think I showed you off the rear of the previous... Oh yeah, I did with War of the Worlds. I didn't show you the rear off with uh, OB Obar. That's our lead character, who actually pops up in this uh, third film. Not as a main character though, he's a supporting character, but he's still a, uh, a vital character to the whole thing. So yeah, in on this disc, again, we have a 2K restoration, supervised by the sound engineer. So just him this time, not the cinematographer or the director. Uh, we've got audio commentary by Daniel Bird from 2023. We've got Sunday with P Peter Skulkin uh, on an archival interview with Skulkin on and writer Tadawis Soboleski, in which the pair discuss the director's films from 2009, clocking at 22 minutes long. Then we've got Banquet, uh, Zofia, Orakos, 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 um again, probably saying that wrong which is an award-winning film about a group of guests at a dinner party or in for a surprise from 1976, looking in at nine minutes long. And again, we have reversible artwork, so, yeah. Which, again, is not particularly hopeful looking, I think you will agree. Spaceship itself looks really rather quite ragged as well. Um, maybe purposely so, or perhaps because the production wasn't particularly high in terms of the budget, but still. And then we have a really nice booklet to go along with this as well. That's from Obi Obar. And yeah, in the booklet itself, we have the cast and crew for each film. We also have War of the Worlds Next Century, The Media Invasion from 2023 by Peter Klotowski. Then we have Having a Blast, Peter Skulking's Nuclear Holocaust from 2023 by Michael Olesik. And then we have Peter Skulking and Exercises in Futility by Olga Drender. That's also from this year. Then we have an interview with the director from 2015 by Ella Bittencourt. Then we have The Grotesque, The Philosophical and The Absurd, three animated counterpoints to Skulking's Apocalypse Trilogy from 2023 by Daniel Bird, and then transfer notes and credits. So, yeah. These are the kind of films that I um, respect more than kind of enjoy, although I did really rather enjoy just, you know, experiencing them, because, yeah, they aren't like anything else I've seen before in terms of, you know, films, especially from the 80s. And, uh, yeah, even um, in comparison to... Andrei Zawalski's films, which we also had on Blu-ray from Eureka, which are, uh, yeah, also three films from a Polish director. I think these are a little bit more consistent, to be honest. Um, I did love the, what was it? I did love the third part of The Night uh, and The Devil, but I found the On the Silver Globe to be a little bit on the underwhelming side of things. But that could just be because it was unfinished and they just basically tried to bring together what was there. But on the whole, I found this box set to be really rather good. And yeah, even though I give Gaga uh, Glory to the Heroes only three and a half out of five, which is obviously less than the previous two, it still is a good film and still one that is well worth watching. Um, all of these films are well worth watching, if I'm honest. Um, especially if you're looking into getting into, into Polish cinema. Uh, I know full well that the Eureka box set did help get me into the Polish cinema and it's one reason why I was looking forward to this box set because I enjoyed these films for the most part. So, yeah, and this box set hasn't really disappointed at all, to be honest. And uh, at the end of the day, I just love that artwork. And that's something that I'm going to keep up in terms of, of the box artwork, to be honest. It's just eye-catching and horrific and really well-drawn. So, uh, yeah, there is that. So, yeah, if you've seen any of these films before, I'd like to hear your thoughts on them. Again, I have to fully apologise for butchering all of these Polish names. 
I don't do it intentionally, but I can't find a lot of these people's names in terms of how to pronounce them. Uh, I'm probably even pronouncing the director's name wrong, even though I uh, listened to that name about 19 times in a row just to try and get the pronunciation right. But like I said, I'm not the best at pronouncing, uh, you know, non-English names. Um, so, yeah, that's just the way it is. But still, this is a fantastic release. Another really, really good box set from Radiance Films. And, uh, yeah, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this video. And, yeah, I look forward to seeing what the rest of Radiance Films has to release for this year. Although, obviously, they don't have a huge amount more to come. Nonetheless, so thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.